So, I'd like to read a little passage uh, from Waking Up to the Dark. This comes about, um, looks like around two-thirds of the way through the book, and it's about storm season. It's strange how much modern people secretly crave weather-related disasters. The blizzard that shuts down a city, bringing travel and commerce to a halt. The tropical storm that knocks out power, leaving millions in the dark. People of earlier centuries rightly feared such events and earnestly prayed to be delivered from them. Now, there is an excitement that begins building the moment we hear of such a storm. That the larger storms sometimes turn deadly does little to chasten our feelings of anticipation. Part of it is the knowledge gleaned from a century of experience that things will soon go back to normal. Another is the paradox of media reports which transform terrible events into a form of nightly entertainment while pretending to inform. In the meantime, provided no one we know has suffered harm, there is some comfort in having nature force our hands. It feels good to release our death grip on the steering wheel and take up the snow shovel instead. There's a tension between the part of us that wants to move along at speed, infatuated with our ever proliferating array of screens and gadgets, and the part of us that deeply hates them too. There's the part that doesn't want to be bothered with other people's lives and is therefore comfortable with the false proximity that social media affords. But there's also the part that is heartbroken at the loneliness and isolation of the life we are living, the part that requires medication and constant distraction just to endure it. If we can't stop ourselves from embracing the things we secretly hate, and know to be bad for us, the question becomes, what will stop us? Climate change is one answer. The end of oil would be another. In the meantime, we have our storms. It's a relief to have life placed on a real footing again when it becomes about water and food, warmth and companionship. It's a relief even if we can't do it for ourselves, even if it lasts only for an evening or a day. A few summers ago, as we were nearing the end of our yearly vacation, we heard that a hurricane was headed straight for Cape Cod. With only a day left on the rental house, we decided to make a dash for it rather than take the brunt of the storm. As it turned out, we'd have been better off staying where we were. Because instead of hitting the Cape, the storm struck a hundred miles inland, wiping out parts of the Catskill town just to the north of us and shutting off the power in our community for over a week. Not only was the whole neighborhood plunged into utter darkness, the whole town was too. A few people powered up generators, but the pinpricks of light they provided were powerless over that much darkness. There was no way they could prevail against the night. People grumbled, but you could tell they were secretly delighted. They just didn't have the vocabulary to express it. Few of us know how saturated our minds and bodies are with light. Even fewer realize how profoundly modern media poisons the soul. The storm brought down huge trees all up and down the road where we live. At night, I'd have to climb over them just to complete my walk. I was sad to lose them, but there was something peaceful about the solid bulk of their bodies lying full across the road. The storm had been violent, but it wasn't a human violence. There was no callousness in it. Whatever is born will die, and those trees understood death better than a Buddha. Later, they were removed piecemeal with a chainsaw by cutting them into manageable lengths and loading them into the backs of pickups that groaned audibly with the weight. 
It was surprising how fast most people adjusted to the longer nights and earlier bedtimes. It was harder to make coffee without electricity, but most people had less need of it anyway. For the first time in months, in some cases years, they were finally getting enough rest. <laughs> Friends who knew about my habit of waking in the dark to walk in the night were suddenly interested in talking with me about it. Some reported strange dreams. A man I barely knew told me, when the grid goes down, the mythical creatures return. That's the illustrator <laughs> of the book. Okay. I chose him based on that comment. Okay. He said it twice, like an incantation. The lit part of my mind dismissed what he was saying, but the dark part knew it was true. Our small town drifted together during those weeks as neighbors who hadn't spoken in years shared meals and news with one another, helping with repairs and errands and catching up on the hundred details of daily life that people share who live on the same road or would share if they talked more often. Without phones, there was no way to communicate without speaking face to face. But just as quickly, the town drifted apart again as people went back to the larger business of the world. The internet was up, the interstate was open, and the TV came back on. People's lives went back to normal after the hurricane was over and its devastation had been repaired or removed, but my own life never went back. That was because of something that happened a week before the storm. One night, on Cape Cod, a voice woke me at 2 a.m. with the words, If you rise to say the rosary tonight, a column of saints will support your prayer. That would have been in pretty close proximity to Our Lady of Lords Church, this one and that one. Yeah. In all the years I'd been waking up in the dark, I had never heard a voice. But for all that week and for the 12 days of darkness that followed the hurricane, it woke me every night. I have said it had something to do with the darkness if it hadn't started before the storm. As it was, it made my experience of the hurricane different than it otherwise would have been. I'd always thought of my night walks as solitary time. I always felt happy and content in the darkness. But apart from my encounters with owls and other animals, I assumed that I was alone in it. Even during the years I'd spent talking to my Zen masters, who had died, neither had spoken to me. Later, when I spoke to God, it was the same. I had no idea what the phrase column of saints might refer to. The phrase had a vaguely Christian ring, but I felt supported that much was true. For the first time in my life, I understood that loneliness was an illusion. Not one of us was ever alone. The dark wasn't dark the way an empty jar was when you looked down into it. It was filled to overflowing with saints. These weren't saints in the ordinary sense. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, said the church as if that were the end of the matter as if soil and rock and water weren't the holiest things on earth. The church was insane when it came to bodies and matter, and especially when it came to dirt. But the dead of the planet were saints nevertheless. They were the body and soul of the world. One night, when the trees were finally off the lines, and the power was soon to come back on, the voice said, you haven't prayed for anything. Is there nothing you want? I thought for a moment. Only for this, I said. <laughs>